everyone, I'm Linda Nickel and welcome to the Happiness Hour. My goal here is to help us all connect, inspire, and create. Every week, a new speaker joins us to share a bit of inspiration, creativity, and tips on how you can improve your photography experience. Upcoming presentations can be found on my website at lindanickel.com. Under Happiness Hour, you'll find the links to my YouTube channel and our community blog. My guest tonight is Ben Pierce. Ben is a landscape photographer based in Lafayette. He leads private photography trips through the swamps of his beloved state of Louisiana. His images reflect the diverse wilderness and valuable ecosystem that a swamp provides and hopes that sharing his work will encourage people to preserve and protect bayou waters that he calls his playground. In tonight's presentation, Celebrating Louisiana's Swamps, and we'll discuss his process for capturing beautiful swamp images, including his pre-shoot routine for identifying the best days for photography, tips for photographing from a kayak or canoe, and what he looks for in his compositions, along with the myths about being in a swamp. Welcome to the Happiness Hour, Ben. Thank you so much for having me. Yay! I'm super excited to hear what you have to say. So a couple of days ago, we kind of did our little pre- uh, let's just check our, check our technology. And so I'm going to confess that I got a preview of some of the images that Ben's going to share with you guys. And they're really, really good. So with that, I'm going to get out of your way and let you do your thing. Um, before you start sharing your screen and jumping into your, to your uh, presentation, can you just kind of do, I kind of just skimmed over um, your little introduction. So if there's anything that you would like to share, Take this opportunity to do that for us. Yeah, um, and I'm going to get into it a little bit in my presentation, but basically I grew up in Louisiana and I've been blessed to have an opportunity to re-fall in love, I guess, with my own state. And that's kind of part of why I got into photography. I grew up here um, since I was five years old, and it wasn't until I actually left the state of Louisiana that I realized how much I missed it and how important it really was to me. And so I'm very pleased to have an opportunity to, to share some of these images with, with everyone here on and also in the future. I'm hoping to make a difference by showcasing what the real beauty of this area is. And it's, it's often thought of in a negative way. So it's just been a great opportunity to be able to use a camera to hopefully have a larger impact on a wilderness that is often too, too, too often forgotten. Hey, you know, I've been to the swamp once or twice, and the first time I really wasn't a photographer or carried a camera other than a little point and shoot, but the second time I went, I was fascinated, and, and I was in Caddo Lake, um, and I was with one of the guys that's here in the, in the room, and I had never, ever experienced autumn in Texas like that. And I took a lot of photos and um, I never really thought of a swamp as being a subject that I would kind of be enamored with. And after seeing the photos from the other day, I'm just, I think you're gonna see a little bit of a, a surge of people visiting Louisiana. Yeah, well, we've, we've seen it over the last 10 years. I've, I've really gotten more involved with this environment over the last 11 years. And, I think there's been some international competitions that have had some swamp imagery here from Louisiana and maybe even from Caddo uh, win. And that has really encouraged a lot of international travelers to come to this area. It's uh, every fall I seem to be paddling and meeting people from different corners of the world. It's really crazy to sit there and say hello to somebody and hear a really thick accent I don't recognize. And then that person might be from Japan or New Zealand or Germany. Uh, I had a guy from Pennsylvania. I was like, wow, you're in the middle of nowhere too. So, I mean, that's, they're coming from all corners. And I think it's for us, something that can be really beneficial for this area, because as I'm going to get into it here in a minute, um, it's just negatively thought about. And if you have something that doesn't have a constituency behind it, then you're going to lose it. And so hopefully these images that, that I take, uh, that some of my friends are taking here in the area, or even these international travelers can bring some awareness to this location in a positive way. So, appreciate the opportunity, everyone, for, for me to be able to be here with, with Linda and all of you. Um, 
I was trying to think of how, how do I start this thing and, and really introduce myself? Well, I'm just kind of a guy with a camera who likes taking photos that I like. I guess I'm more like a collector than, than anything else. Um, I, I like taking photos and I've always kind of had that adrenaline rush of trying to make it out there for a sunrise or a sunset. And so I probably just, honestly, I'm probably just an addict and a collector when it really comes down to it. And it just happens to be luckily a camera that I'm using to, uh, to, to, to feed my, uh, my needs that way. Um, but I really, really love being able to have a chance to, to show what swamps are. And there's so many people who think of it in, in, in such a different way than I see it. Um, to be able to maybe hopefully change some of those opinions is, is definitely an honor. So tonight's presentation is called Celebrating Louisiana Swamps. And as Linda mentioned, I wanna talk a little bit about what swamps really are, um, how to photograph them, and then the kind of the little tips and tricks that I've kind of come across over my last 10 plus years of really being fully immersed in this environment. Uh, the first image right here, just to kind of start off with my title page is a sunrise over in the Henderson Swamp area of the Atchafalaya Basin about 20 miles east of Lafayette, Louisiana, between Lafayette and Baton Rouge. Uh, an amazing playground. Millions of people travel across the bridge. That's just north of this image um, every single year. And for a lot of people, they're traveling across the bridge, seeing this thing as just this arduous task of having to go 18 miles on, on the country's third longest bridge and looking down going, I don't know what's down there. I don't know, you know if it's safe. If I got down there, where would I go? What would I see? Would I be able to make it back to where I started? And there's so many questions associated with this environment that to be able to sit there and try to show these beautiful images, hopefully will encourage them to want to come and explore it and see it. And if they think of it in a positive way, then maybe in their own communities, they can have a positive impact on this area. And so I'll talk a little bit about that in just a second. So a little bit about myself. Um, I was born in Denver, Colorado, but I was, I've been raised here in Lafayette, Louisiana. Moved here when I was five years old. Um, got my degree in landscape architecture from LSU back in 2005, and that really kind of jump-started my creative process, um, just kind of thinking about the world in a different way. As a landscape architect, we're trying to figure out how the natural world uh, can kind of mingle with the built world in a human environment, and for me, photography is a great way to do that, and how do we showcase the beauty of our natural world, and how do we make humans feel more comfortable in a space, and so it's kind of a combination here of how my photography and my love for the swamps has kind of melded with my original career path. Um, I fell in love with photography when I moved uh, to Asheville, North Carolina after graduating from college. And the reason I kind of got into it is I was out there in the mountains of Western North Carolina and try trying to showcase uh, what I was seeing and experiencing there because I'm a flatlander. I come from the land of cane fields and bayous and to be in the mountains, I was going, man, my friends would love to see this experience that I'm having here. Um, and so I started getting into photography and started shooting images. At the time, it was just point and shoot Kodak. I think it was a four megapixel camera. So not much of anything, but I got a chance to showcase that area with my friends and family back home. And their response to what they were seeing just kind of encouraged me to continue to take to the trail. And as I was trying to tell the stories of my experiences, I just wanted to start growing and figuring out how do I best capture this environment that I'm, I'm seeing here in the mountains. And so I just started to grow into, uh, you know, more serious photography. Um, in addition to, to kind of my background in landscape architecture, um, I'm now serving as the executive director for a nonprofit here, located here in Lafayette called Louisiana Swamp Base. Uh, it is associated with the Boy Scouts of America, at least initially, and is growing beyond that. So my part with Swamp Base it encourages um, young men and women from across the country to come down to Louisiana and spend five days and four nights fully immersed in the swamps of Louisiana, paddling over 60 miles. And the idea being that if we showcase this environment firsthand to these young people, when they go back north into the larger Mississippi River watershed or other places of the country, they'll have an idea of how they are environmentally connected to the water systems. And so, for instance, if you have a, a scout traveling from Montana down here. They're connected in the Mississippi River drainage basin. And what they do in their own communities could have a positive or negative impact on the swamps of Louisiana. Um, our area here is like at the bottom of a funnel. So if you look at the Mississippi River, it's this big funnel and all of this water flows down to the basin in Louisiana. So if people are putting trash or pollutants into the water, it could have an impact on our, 
our state and these environments. So we're looking for ways to, to use scouting as a new mechanism of creating that constituency that I mentioned earlier about getting people to, to be the champions for this area and want to see it improve. And since we started that program back in 2013, we've had almost 5,000 scouts out there on the water seeing it firsthand. Uh, combined mileage though, they've paddled over 280,000 miles through the swamp. So we're really trying to make an impact and get those eyeballs there on this environment to try to break some of those myths. Uh, additionally about myself, I've been married for 16 years. Um, to, I've got a, a great wife, two outdoorsy kids. We're outside all the time. Um, they haven't quite still after all these years uh, fallen in love with my love of photography because they're the ones kind of getting drug around or dad's taking too long on the trails or whatever. But um, they love the outdoors and I continue to encourage them to, to be that way. Uh, the gear that you're going to be seeing used here, um, I'm a Canon shooter. I have really no loyalty to any brand, but that just happens to be what I have. And when you're on a fixed budget, uh, you shoot what you got and you just grow from there. So I'm sure there's some Sony and Nikon and Olympus and, and everybody else in here, but um, I definitely don't believe that my brand or the brand I use is the best. It's just what I know and what I use. So these will all be Canon images that you see. Um, I have started to collect some lenses over the years. So there's going to be a combination of some wide angle, um, some telephoto, and then I'll, every once in a while I'll have some macro lens um, shots that I may throw in there as well. So let's uh, learn a little bit more about swamps, right? So there's all kinds of misconceptions about this area. Um, as you sit there and you talk to people, and maybe you even have them yourselves, wherever you are in the country, if you hadn't had a chance to spend a lot of time in a swamp, you might be influenced by people from the outside, maybe Hollywood, TV, maybe even a mystery novel that you read, talks about these areas being disgusting places where people really don't go out to survive. You know, if you're going to a swamp, there's, there's bad things that are going to happen. Um, people use terms like infested when they talk about alligators, waterways infested with alligators, or, or they may talk about snakes falling from trees or just the endless swarms of mosquitoes and other bugs that are going to bite you, right? We always joke with our scouts, um, did anybody donate blood this week in the swamp, right? Because there's so many mosquitoes out there. Um, but that response is a little bit different than what you would think, actually. So we've got all these different negative connotations about this environment, but what is it really you don't know this, you wouldn't know it until you actually go and have a chance to be in it yourself. And uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about some of those misconceptions. For one of them, the largest one that I always hear about before I guide somebody into, into the water, into the swamp, is about the alligators. You know, how dangerous are they? Um, how many of them are we going to see? Uh, do they bump into the canoes or the kayaks? Do they try to flip you over? I'm sure you're thinking those same things when you think about going out into a swamp. Alligators are incredibly docile or shy creatures. Uh, when we try to photograph them, they're often swimming away from us. They don't really want to mess with a boat, definitely don't want to mess with, with us, with paddles and noise and all these other things. And people have continued to kind of grow this misconception that they are dangerous creatures. Um, crocodiles, their cousins, are the dangerous creatures. And they're really no more dangerous than bears, sharks, uh, gray wolves. They're not even as dangerous as a moose or even deer. Deer kill more people um, annually than, than all those even combined. Um, alligators really are fairly safe to be with, I guess, like you could say. Um, they really don't want anything to do with, with humans. We're not on the menu. And to, to try to encourage somebody to, to break down all of those things that they've heard for so many years is very difficult. Um, another, well, I guess this is why, because you have a 14-foot alligator swimming at you like this, uh, could be a little bit, um, a little bit scary. Um, this is an alligator though that we see on one of the swamp tours out in the Atchafalaya. And these alligators are, are known just to go towards the boats because they're going to tour boats because they're being fed. So there's some kind of false sense of what's actually happening here on an image like this. If this was an alligator that wasn't part of a tour or wasn't kind of, um, had been manipulated a little bit that way, he would be going the other direction. This one's looking for a handout more more than likely. Um, or a baby alligator like this who's going to come up to the boat just because they're curious. Um, no, nothing really dangerous about it, just kind of out there going, you know, what are you doing out here in the water? You don't look like you belong, but I'm coming to take a look um, because I'm new to this world and everything looks kind of fun to me. So a couple of images just to show you some alligators that you can really get some great shots of them up close if you're patient and, uh, and quiet. Another huge misconception is that the place, the swamps are full of snakes. Um, I've actually never seen a snake when I've guided another photographer into the swamps. Um, in fact, when I'm out there 
I may see one snake a year if I'm lucky. And I say lucky because it's cool to see one because it's so rare for me. Uh, the ones I typically see that are going to be non-venomous water snakes, um, maybe some gray snakes on uh, rat snakes on land or racers. Uh, but you really don't see snakes out there. It's, it's definitely a misconception that they'd be falling from the trees and, you know, hanging from the branches and everything and trying to climb up into your boat. You just don't see them. Um, the other one is mosquitoes. And that can be an issue. I mean, there's a reality of it, but they're really no worse than other areas in the country. Um, there are times during the day in the heat of the summer when they are the worst. At dawn, at dusk, uh, can be a little bit uh, of a nuisance, but within 15 minutes or so, they've pretty much gone away and you can get back to just enjoying being outside. So the idea of them carrying you away and, and, and draining all of your blood and these other things that people talk about just aren't true. Um, and unfortunately, we have these misconceptions out there that prevent people from entering this environment. Um, they don't want to go out there and experience it and understand its true beauty and its value because we continue to grow these negative stereotypes about this area. And so photography and showing the beauty of it is a great way to try to combat all of those things that people are talking about this area in a negative way. And hopefully, if you've never been in a swamp and you see some of these images, maybe they'll encourage you, uh, and I know you guys are more like-minded, uh, but hopefully it'll encourage you to try to go and explore a swamp maybe in your own area. So, you know, what are swamps, as I was saying, they are incredibly diverse environments full of flora and fauna. Um, there is literally photo opportunities all over the place. Uh, when I take a tour, uh, tour somebody out there in the swamp, I always make sure that they, they're taking some, some pain medication, um, hopefully beforehand, because their neck is going to be sore when they're all said and done. Uh, they'll be looking all over the place, at the water, in the trees, over their shoulder, left, right, you know, every direction, there's great opportunities for compositions and, and just beautiful lighting and scenery that is very foreign to a lot of people. So this is a beautiful environment that needs more people out there photographing it in order for it to be saved. And here in Louisiana, uh, we have uh, one of the largest swamps in the country, the Atchafalaya Basin. It's 1.4 million acres. It's about the size of Delaware. And we don't have people out there who are really wanting to protect it. And so hopefully through what I'm doing with the scouts uh, and through my photography, we have a chance to, to, to make an impact, kind of leave a legacy. So that program, as I mentioned, is called Swamp Base. And we get, like I said, scouts from all over the country to come down here and experience it firsthand. Um, I love this image right here. This is the only image I'm gonna share that was actually taken with a drone. Uh, we don't have any tall trees this tall out there, but this was taken with a drone. And when you have a flat environment like this and you get a chance to get above the tree line, it really makes an impact on how vast this space is, this place. And so we get above the trees and we really can show um, how, how connected we really are here. We get so used to having trees on our sides or cane fields running along our roads and kind of get boxed in a little bit. And when you get, use a drone like this, you can really see how expansive this environment is and how, how diverse it is through the trees, uh, the shrubs and everything else. Just another image here too. Uh, it takes a lot of work to get out into these areas. These scouts would have woken up about 4 a.m. Um, hopped into a canoe at 5 a.m. and then probably paddled about four or five miles that morning just to try to arrive for the sunrise here at a place called Sandy Cove. And so me, myself, having to be out there in a boat, not with them and trying to chase them down to get this photo was incredibly early, like a 3 a.m. wake up for me to try to see them watch the sunrise. But this is, these are moments when they're out there in the swamp that are going to be life changing. And when we hear these scouts leave, right before they leave, we talk to them about their experience. And if it was gross and disgusting and nasty and these other things that they would describe it beforehand, they leave with it being majestic and, and underappreciated, beautiful. Um, some of them even call it home and they're not from this area. So it's really awesome to be able to have a chance to make a positive impact on an environment like this. And we're doing storytelling along the way with our photos, right? In addition to just capturing the scouts as they paddle, when I'm out there by myself, you know, as many weekends as I can fit in during the year, I want to be out there telling the stories. Uh, our swamps here in Louisiana were devastated 100, 125 years ago by the lumber industry. They almost clear cut the entire uh, cypress swamps here in our state. So we have remnant stumps of cypress trees all throughout the area. And being able to showcase those to people will hopefully make an impact where we don't make these same mistakes again, maybe on a different environment. 
look what happened to this environment here, right in our country that we talk about deforestation in the, in the Amazon and these other places in the world. Well, we did it in our own country and we wanna make sure that we don't make that same mistake again. So having these opportunities to, to capture images that can help to share the story of the past and to make a positive impact on the future is, is something that I, I definitely um, take to heart. So there are a ton of great swamp photographers and it's, it continues to grow every single year. Um, I could name a list of some of my favorites that have become friends, um, but I want to just talk a little bit about the two main focus kind of swamp photographers that I think anybody who's been out there photographing would say are the two names that come to mind. And the first one here I want to say as an inspiration is Mr. C.C. Lockwood. Um, C.C.'s from Baton Rouge. Um, his claim to fame is he really introduced the Atchafalaya Basin to the rest of the world back in the 1970s through National Geographic. I'm sure no one on this uh, Zoom meeting has a subscription to National Geographic anymore. I don't know anybody who does, but uh, through CC's images of this area and of the culture and the people of the swamps of here in Louisiana, he brought great attention to it. Um, the alligator, the American alligator at the time was an endangered species. Um, it was being overhunted. He captured beautiful images of alligators with their babies and these other things and helped to create a conservation movement that allows us to see alligators in numbers that we've never thought we could ever see you know, again. again. Um, so he's done a great job initially of really opening this environment to the rest of the world. Additionally, uh, Greg Girard grew up in Catahoula, Louisiana um, in St. Martin Parish and became a very good friend of mine before he passed in 2017. Um, he was a writer as well as photographer, a teacher, um, and one of his favorite hobbies as he got older, in addition to crawfishing, which he's got there, was collecting the old cypress logs out of the swamp. Um, but he did an amazing job in a different way, having actually lived in that environment and having his family um, living on houseboats and, and having camps in the Atchafalaya and in the swamp to really capture a way of life out there. And so in addition to Cece, um, Greg is a, it was a great proponent to this area and a, a great photographer that really inspired uh, I think a new generation of people to get out there and see this beautiful environment. So when can you see the environment, right? Uh, when is the best time to get out into a swamp? Well, anytime, frankly. Um, there are great photo opportunities at spring, summer, fall, winter. It just depends on what you're looking for and what you wanna to add to your portfolio. Um, I try to get out there as often as I can. And frankly, I don't know if I have a favorite time of the year because as soon as it's that time of year, I'm longing for the next season to, to come up uh, and try something different. But spring, uh, definitely get the new green leaves, kind of the chartreuse green of the cypress trees as they start to, to pop. Uh, the native wildflowers and the irises are starting to bloom along the banks. And then you get all of the birds moving in. So when the warm weather starts to hit this area, you get all the wading birds, um, you get the songbirds. So wildlife just starts to come alive in spring. The alligators start to kind of come out of um, their bromation, which is a little bit different than hibernation, but they start to move around a little bit more. Then by the summertime, you've got this nice dense foliage there. Uh, you really start to see kind of that, um, that the, the vibrant colors of the swamp. They get these nice dark greens. The, the lighting changes a little bit as the sun kind of tries to get through the leaves and the Spanish moss. And then if you're looking for, for the alligators, they're the most visible during the summertime as that's the warmer waters tend to bring them out. Fall, I, Louisiana has fall color. Our swamps have fall color. It's just very underappreciated. Um, a lot of people go out to the, to the Appalachian Mountains or into the Rockies or in the Northeast for fall color. And Louisiana's fall color, though when it comes to the hard, hardwood trees like oaks and everything else aren't spectacular. The cypress trees are, they really are a show and they turn a fiery orange color during the summer or during the fall. That is just second to none. Uh, you go into an area that's basically a monoculture, all cypress trees and everywhere you look is orange, a solid color of orange. It's like going to the Aspens in the Rockies where you have that beautiful yellow fall color just on a different spectrum. Um, in the fall, you also have a good chance for getting the misty waters. It starts to look a little creepy. And then low water season is typically in the fall, which allows the trees to be taller. So we have water levels that change and fluctuate up and down. And when the water levels are at their lowest, that means the trees are at their tallest. Um, because when you're out there on the water and the water's high, you might be in the canopy or midway up the tree. When the water levels drop, you get a chance to see the full trunk of those trees, the buttressing of their bases that is so, uh, so 
well known as a characteristic of the Cyprus. And then in the wintertime, that's when you really get the dense fog. So if you want to go out there and, and really have those spooky images, kind of like the one I just showed you that, that Greg had taken, where the trees are really isolated and there's nothing else, else in the background, dense fog in the wintertime is perfect. Uh, you can see the character of the trees as the leaves drop. Cypress trees will drop their leaves. So you can really see the, the gnarly branches, uh, the Spanish moss kind of dripping from, from those branches. It's really beautiful and haunting uh, when you're out there in the wintertime. So frankly, any time is a good time. You just got to figure out what do you want to add to your portfolio when you're, when you're going out into a swamp. All right, before you go on, I'm going to, I'm going to interrupt you with a couple of questions while we're in here. Okay. Um, so Rose is wondering, she's just curious, what dictates the water level changes per season? Do you know? Yeah, absolutely. So as I mentioned, we are connected to the Mississippi River drainage basin. And because of that, we have about 40% of the country flowing down here into Louisiana. So when you have the snow melt and the rains in the Midwest, basically anywhere from the Rockies to the Appalachian Mountains, when you have all that rain coming down, it goes into the Mississippi. The Atchafalaya is directly connected to the Mississippi. So we get high waters in the springtime coming down from a lot of snow melt. And then in the fall time, when we aren't getting those same rains up north of us, the, the swamp is able to kind of drain out. So that's where you get a big fluctuation. And in some areas, that fluctuation can be between 10 and 15 feet. Okay. Um, Greg is wondering, what month does fall start in the swamps? So we have one of the latest fall color months, and we also have a very long fall color season. So you could go to other places in the country and then still make it down to Louisiana if you really wanted to. Um, I start to see a little bit of that hint in October, mid to late October, probably more late October. You really are getting the peak season though for fall color between um, the third and fourth week of November. So right around Thanksgiving time is when you're gonna really see those, those, those most vibrant oranges. Now, of course that can always change year to year depending on how the winds are and they're knocking the leaves off or if you have an early cold spell that, that also has the leaves fall off the trees. But typically the third, fourth week of November is gonna be your highlight. Um, as you get into December though, you'll still find trees that are um, in peak color. They're just a little bit more sporadic. Uh, throughout December, and I've even seen them into early January as well. So you can find some couple trees here and there that make a nice stark contrast between the gray trees uh, of the swamp. Okay. Um, Jamie's wondering, what's the average depth of the swamp generally? I don't know if there is an average depth. Um, it, it just depends on the lake or the bayou that you're in. If you're in a man-made canal, it could be 15 to 20 feet deep because it's been dredged. Um, if you're in a big open lake, it could be six inches, could be a few feet. It just, it depends on how much sediment is being brought in there. Again, that connection to the Mississippi is very important to how a swamp kind of lives. And if you have a lot of sediment coming down the Mississippi and it comes into the swamp, you're going to have these lakes fill up with sediment. And so our, our lakes become shallow. I was told by uh, an old Cajun fisherman one time that a lake that I, I paddle on all the time was 40 to 60 feet deep which is hard to believe because when I hop out of my kayak, it's to my thighs. Um, that just shows you over the last 50 to 60 years, how much sediment has moved into some of these waterways and really has had a negative impact in some places where you had areas that were only cypress trees and now they're being inundated with willows and other trees that can start to grow on these small islands that are starting to be formed out in some of these areas. Okay. One more question, Susan, who is an underwater, um, photographer, she does a lot of snorkeling. Um, she's wondering, the photo of CC. Um, yeah. she's wondering, you know, what is he wearing um, in that shot of him in the water and what protected his camera, do you, do you know? So this image is definitely, because CeCe's a little bit older than this now, this is a shot probably taken back in the 70s or early 80s. Um, he might be not, he might not be wearing anything, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I wasn't there for this image. Um, Let's just I, say that. Let's just I, leave that on. <laughs> I, I, I don't think he's using much to protect himself back then, or the camera gear, that is. It, it looks like he's got a strap around his neck that's pretty well weathered, um, and he's got an old Nikon right there. Um, yeah, I don't think at that time he was really as, as concerned about it as getting that shot right there with, with that, that lily pad and, and probably trying to make something that would be National Geographic worthy. But um, yeah, when you're a swamp photographer, you kind of have to put all of the care about your gear to the side because stuff is going to get wet at some point. Yeah. That makes sense. Okay. Um, thank you for letting me interrupt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. please do. Okay. Uh, so 
this is pretty typical. I know a, a lot of y'all will will, uh, will use some of these or a combination of, of, of other type of applications. Um, these are the four that I use before I leave home, the things I'm checking. And the number one thing I do before I, I go out is I always check Google Earth if it's a place I've never been, right? So I want to go out there and, and make sure I, I know where I'm going, all these things, Google Maps, all that stuff. Photo pills has become very, very popular over the last several years, helping with some applications of where lighting is and, and times of day. And then my two weather apps I use are Storm, that's the one on the lower left, and then Weather Underground. And they basically are just to bounce off of each other to try to determine what forecast is really going to look like. It's going to probably be a combination of, of the two or somewhere in between. But I use Google Earth uh, primarily as for scouting the new locations. I mean, it's super easy. Uh, of course, if you turn on the photo button, sometimes you can find some great photos on there or find photos that aren't so great that you go, huh, I kind of still like what they're going with there. Maybe I can do something with that. That's maybe a little bit better. Uh, but I want to understand the context of the area that I'm shooting. Uh, part of that really is when you're in the swamp is knowing where the tree lines are going to be. And when I combine that with some of my weather apps, and I'll tell you here in a second, I get an idea about where I'm wanting to go. Um, when I wake up early on a Saturday uh, morning or, or the Friday night before I'm going out, sometimes I'm not really sure where I'm going to go. And it really depends on how that location looks. What are the, what's the alignment of the trees or the bayous or the lake versus the wind? And so we'll talk a little about that in a second. Of course, photo pills, as you know, uh, used for the sunrise and sunset locations. What a great uh, tool this and some others that do this uh, are for us to be able to pinpoint where where you are um, on a map anywhere in the world and be able to see where is that sun going to rise, where is that sun going to set, the moon going to rise and set. And we just had a full moon just a few days ago. You know, gosh, uh, I wish I didn't have a day job because I would have been out there photographing a moon set, um, you know, on when or I guess Monday or, or Sunday. But um, great application for us to be able to figure out where things are so we can start to already kind of pre-plan maybe some compositions or some areas that we want to go while we're out there. This is really though the only app I still use while I'm on the water or in the environment because uh, as I move around, my, pin, my pinpoint needs to move to with me so I can kind of get, get an idea, especially if it's you know early morning hours before the sun has come up, I'm trying to figure out where is that gonna be relative to where I am. And then my, um, my weather apps are the ones I use most frequently though, because uh, I'm always, watching the weather. And the things I'm looking for um, are really going to be uh, wind speed, wind direction, of course, precipitation. I don't want to go out there if it's just storming, um, and cloud cover. And if I, a combination of having an understanding of these allows me to have a better idea of what shots I'm looking for. There are many days where I'm ready to go and I get up and I'm, I'm looking at my weather apps and everything. I'm like, it's just not going to be ideal for what I want. And I have a certain particular you know, set of criteria with my, with what my weather is. I've become picky over the years and I'm not gonna waste my time going out in some places where I know I'm not gonna get the shot I want or maybe it's just something that I'm not gonna be able to handle. You know, Maybe it's too windy and, and I'll be blowing around a little bit too much and not gonna be able to get a shot that I really would be happy with. And um, I value my time very much so and I value my photography time very much. And so I don't wanna waste it um, when I'm out there. Maybe save it for another day, you know, kind of. I guess you could fold on that day and, and, and go to another one. That might be better. Let me let me slip in another question. Um, this is from Tobias. Um, he wants to know, are you able to get a forecast for fog or do you just look at dew points and temperature? It, fog is, is, fog and mist are very hard to predict. Um, I'll definitely watch my local forecast here, um, weather forecast with my, you know, on the local televisions, just to see if they say anything about fog or mention it. You know, if they're saying, hey, we have a dense fog advisory tomorrow, boom, I'm, I'm ready to go. We'll figure that out. We'll, we'll make something happen. Um, but that's a very tough one. I've not been able to find an app that really focuses on fog. So if anybody knows any, please put it in the comments. I would love to, to, to find that and have a chance to, to take a look. But for me, it's looking at, um, you know, obviously looking at humidity. And so if I have high humidity and that 96, 7, 8, 9 percent humidity predicted for that morning. I'm going to probably be thinking there might be a chance for some for some mist. Um, I can leave my house and see kind of misty conditions over the, uh, the agricultural fields in the area and then get on the water and there's nothing there. Uh, more times than not, I'm disappointed. Uh, but sometimes 
you get those perfect conditions that just happen to come out and you weren't expecting them. Uh, and it just happens to be that kind of micro environment that the lake or the waterway is creating that creates this little fog area, maybe some a little bit of like a temperature inversion that gives you fog or some mist. And so you kind of plan around the humidity. Uh, if there's a change in temperature, you know, if I get some colder weather that pops in and the water waters are still pretty warm, there's a good chance I'm gonna have some mist there too. So I try to be a little bit of a meteorologist myself, even though I struggle at it every single time I go out and kind of, it's kind of a crapshoot most times. But um, my main thing that I'm really looking for on a day-to-day is, is going to be the wind. Um, I want to make sure that my wind speeds are low. And that's for a couple things. Uh, if I have good low wind speeds, I'm going to get a better chance for some mirrored reflections. So that's number one. And for the, the swamp, the really to make some great drama and, some, and amazing images, it's all about the reflection for me. Having choppy water that breaks up the, the, the kind of the reflection to me just doesn't Aesthetically, it's not my thing. So I look for as calm of waters as possible. Those also mean, or calm, calm, calm winds with the calm waters. Calm winds will also mean that it's not blowing away any of the mist maybe or any of the fog. So if I have a chance for that out there, it's not just gonna get blown away. And then the other thing is too, if I don't have strong winds, I can be in my kayak and be pretty stationary. And so I'm not having to adjust the entire time or, or feeling like I'm moving a little bit, these little micro moves where I may put my, my shutter speed might want to be a little bit lower if I can, and I'm not going to get blurry images. So if as long as I can try to create myself my own little tripod there, you know, be as still as I can, low winds are going to be a big benefit for that. Um, again, as I mentioned, high humidity is going to be really important for misty day, just like this image right here. You know, I had high humidity. It was, a, this is going to be um, more of a winter shot right here, taken probably in, in December or January. So I had you know, cold temperature day it was probably in the, in the mid thirties or so the water was still warm in the lake. So we got a nice little reflection, uh, and mist there. Sometimes, you know, like I said, you, you think it's going to be that way and it just doesn't, doesn't come out. Um, looking at the skies though, same thing. You're trying to figure out when are you going to have some partly cloudy skies. If I have bright, clean skies, you know, blue skies above, I might have some harsh light earlier than I want to. I'm going to have to try to probably crop out some of my light with, with how I shoot some of these images. So I'm looking for those, those partly cloudy mornings and, and evenings. So that way I got a better chance of having a nice vibrant uh, puffy clouds and really get that vibrant golden hour light. And uh, you see those pink magentas in the sky. So if you want to really create the drama in your skies, you've got to hope for the partly cloudy skies. I, I'm not a big fan of shooting on the blue sky days. And again, cause I'm picky, but um, it's just been, you know, what I'm looking for in an image and what I think gets my, you know, gets my attention, gets me excited about it. So I try not to shoot on, uh, on clear days if I can help it. So with all that planning, you know, these are some of the kind of the images that you'll get. This happened to be a little bit more luck in, in what the color of the sun was that, that evening. Uh, but we had a chance to, to go out there. I knew exactly where the sun was going to set. Um, this was an interesting story with it, though. I'm so focused at this point before the shot was taken. I'm looking at a dense cypress area. The, the light was amazing. Um, and my, my buddy, Matt, who's also here on the call, uh, hollers at me, hey, you're missing the sunset. And I didn't even know what was happening. I had completely forgotten. We got lost. You know, we get distracted in, in our own compositions. And so I had to race over to, to get this one. I just barely got it before it went down. But I knew where the sun was going to set the entire time, and I just forgot to focus on it. But the red color came from the fires out west. Uh, we were impacted by the smoke. Um, here. So we still got a really beautiful sunset here. And this would have been an easy one to plan. You know, here's where the sun's going to set. We've got a great um, framing opportunity with the cypress trees, um, some big distance between the foreground trees and the distant trees. So you can have uh, that amazing depth there and uh, really get some good context to the scene. And then in addition to, this, to that, you know, where this is the moon. Uh, so the moon was setting a full moon over at Lake Martin. This would be one of those days where I'm going, all right, I got the part of the cloudy skies. I got the moon. I know where it's going to be setting. Winds are a little higher than I want them to be. So instead of being in the kayak, I shot from land on this day. So this would have been with a tripod. Uh, so I tried to blur a little bit of the waterway there, but it was definitely pretty choppy that morning. But still wanted to make sure I had the moon there and I had the beautiful colors in the sky that came from just looking at my apps and, and, and having a better understanding of what the morning was going to bring. So I've been mentioning a lot about 
um, being on the water. So let me talk a little bit about some of the kind of the pros and cons of photographing the swamp on land versus on water. And I didn't start really paddling until 2011 or 12 really was my kind of first time really getting out there on the water. Before that, I was mostly a land-based photographer, having lived in North Carolina for a while and all been all tripod, hiking, all that stuff. I just wasn't used to, to paddling or, or being on the water. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the pros and cons. And, you know, pros of being on, on land is obviously it's just really easy to set up a tripod, bring as much gear as you want. You don't have to have any additional skill set. Really, if you can walk somewhere or drive somewhere, you can set up and get some, get some great images. Uh, the problem with, though, with being on land is you're, especially with a, an environment like a swamp, is you're very limited with your compositions. It's going to be a roadway. It's going to be a little trail. Um, because we are flat and in our environment down here, you can only see so much. So you're not going to get those elevated chain, you know, shots like you would out in the mountains um, where a trail kind of snakes around and turns and all this stuff. It's going to usually be kind of straight shots and it's, it's a little bit difficult. The other thing is though, a lot of these locations are going to be overshot because a lot of people are afraid to go in the water. All those misconceptions that I talked about earlier, people don't want to get into water because they're afraid of it. And so they're going to shoot the same images over and over and over again. So if you want to kind of find your own creativity, you got to get on the water. Um, Pros of the water. Look, I mean, if you compare these two right here, I got a lot more pros to being on land versus on water. But to me, the two pros for the water outweigh any of any of the cons. You know, it's more opportunities for your original compositions. I like being by myself typically, just because it's kind of my own little church. You know, I get to sit out there and, and, and have some spiritual time to to capture the amazing you know tapestry that's in front of me. Um, but the cons of being on the water. And they're, they're tough and they, a lot of them will prevent people from going out and paddling and being a, a swamp photographer in that manner because it's more difficult. It's, you know, it's more physical. Um, you know, it requires a lot, a lot of patience. The boat is always moving. And as soon as you think you got a right composition, that boat is moving a little bit and you got to reposition. And so unlike being on land where it's like, oh, well, I can just step to the side a little bit. No, I know how to move my tripod. Now you're pulling your tripod up maybe out of the water or you're having to do these little micro paddles to readjust. And it can be a real pain um, to do it. And if you're not used to it, you, you get very tired of it very quickly. Um, the other thing is just the fear of having all your gear over the water. I mean, we spend lots of money. Um, we our, our gear is like our babies. And to sit there and say, I'm going to hang my, you know, my camera over the edge of this boat, or I'm going to stand in this lake with, you know, $6,000 of gear in my hand or whatever it might be. I don't know. I don't have that kind of gear, but it was some expensive stuff. You're like, eh, I don't know. Maybe not, maybe not for me, but for me, it really is all about being on the water. Uh, and here's two great images of the exact same tree to compare a land-based shot and a water-based shot. So the tree on the left floating cypress, was an image I've been trying for several years to capture. This is probably the most photographed cypress tree in all the state of Louisiana. It's over at Lake Martin. It's at the end of a peninsula that is easily accessible from a parking lot. And so you can park there, walk right down a grass peninsula, and boom, take a photo of this tree. It, this tree is on numerous yellow pages. If people remember what the yellow pages are, it's in uh, people's uh, engagement shoots. It's in wedding shoots. Um, you know, every kind of thing possible, this tree is in it. And this is the pretty much the typical image you're gonna get for the, the side of this tree. You know, I love this image. It's one of my favorites I've ever taken because I really was trying to get this shot where I didn't have the distant bank um, being able to be seen. And it just really kind of felt like it was just pasted on this nice blue and white uh, background. But the image on the right was taken from the water. And you can see that this tree has a lot more character to it than what you would get from just the face on from the peninsula. In fact, the peninsula in that image is actually to the left where the boat is coming from. Um, so this is a composition that has, in my mind, had never been taken before. I've never seen anyone take a picture of this tree from this angle because nobody had gone on the water and done that. Um, the added benefit of being able to have the boat there, uh, those guys leaving out into the lake was, was just super special, great timing, just happened to be there at the right time. But if I had taken it from land, I would have gotten the rear of that boat instead of the profile of the boat. And it would have been a, just not as not as good of an image. It wouldn't, have, it wouldn't have had that same sense of adventure or, or you know, kind of draw you in. So there's advantages. I mean, the, the shot on the left is, is going to be crisp, clear, you know, pin sharp every day of the week. The one on the right, 
I can come home and have a lot of blurry images and maybe hopefully have a good one um, because I may be moving around in my boat and I've got now I've got boat traffic out there in, in the wake of those. So you can be impacted either way. It really depends on how comfortable you are, but if you want to get the best shots, you really got to get on the water. I mean, that's where the, the creativity really starts to, to come out. And there, there's a shot of me getting that uh, sunset just a, a few weeks ago. Um, you know, we're probably uh, about a mile or so from uh, land at this point, I paddled out there. We don't move very fast when we're in our kayaks with our cameras. There's no long distance races happening here. It's pretty much get on the water, hurry up, paddle as hard as you can to the spot and then just try to enjoy it and, and find compositions. But um, this is pretty much me in my natural habitat right here. But being on the water is not always fun and games. Um, this is how I set up for any long uh, exposure images or some of my panoramas that I, that I shoot. Uh, I don't typically get into the water. Um, I just don't like being wet and then going back to the truck wet, even with waders and all that other stuff. So I, I have a tripod that's fairly long. Um, I know someone who has a 12 foot tall tripod so they can get in some really deep water. I think mine ends up maxing out about eight feet or so. And so I can get that thing down into some mud and still feel pretty safe about where it is uh, in the water. It's not going to really be impacted too much by any wave action. Um, the hardest part, though, for some of these images is just trying to keep my kayak away from bumping into the legs. So I'll be, of course, I'll want to take a five second exposure and then bump my kayak hits, hits a leg and the whole thing is blurry. Start all over again. Or the wind blows me away and I'm watching my, you know, tripod, my camera off in the distance and I'm going, oh my God, oh, nothing happens to it. While it's uh, 50 feet away from me, I'm trying to frantically get back to it without you know, disturbing the water too much. Uh, but you know, for every good idea and everything, I, you know, I try to get into the water and I fill up my boot with, with, you know, with water and mud. And so uh, even though you try to stay dry, mishaps will, will happen when you're, when you're out there paddling, you just have to anticipate it and, and be prepared. But this was that image that was captured uh, from that, that, that very morning. This would be one of those that I, I went out there because the water was incredibly low, um, which allowed you to see this great cypress stump, but it would not have been what I would consider an ideal morning for me, typically, because there, as you can see, barely any clouds in the sky. And so because of that, I wanted to really put the emphasis on this stump and make sure that the top of it broke the canopy line of the distant trees. So it really would um, draw your eye up a little bit more and not get lost in the surrounding forest. So this is one of those things that was kind of like I had to get out there because the water was water levels were just too ideal for this type of shot. And you kind of just are stuck with what, what you have. But I really ended up liking what the final product was here with the blues kind of contrasting a lot of the yellows and greens there in the tree on that morning. So there's the initial shot there um, of me with the setup in that stump and then what the final product ended up being with uh, the panorama. So what I think about before venturing out and kind of try to encourage other people to think about is really slowing down mentally. Um, a lot of things are going on when you're in a kayak or a canoe and you're on the water and you got your gear and you're trying to figure out settings and the lights changing and you know birds are flying by and alligators are swimming by and you can be a little bit nervous and kind of a little bit uh, frantic, just trying to slow down and breathe. It's, really helps me get out there and stay focused on what I'm trying to accomplish. Um, when it comes down to actually pulling the camera up and, and looking through my lens, trying to figure out how to tame the chaos. Um, there are so many things going on in a swamp environment with how these the, the woods are and the, the branches and the moss and the lighting and everything else. How do you find focus in your images? How do you find focus mentally, but also how do you find focus in your images? And then remaining stable. Uh, I've got so many blurry images that I've deleted over the years. I really have to consciously think about staying, staying stable, breathing, and being able to hold my camera as still as I can, because a lot of cases I'm wanting to shoot, you know, one over 20 or one over 30, and those types of shutter speeds can lead to some blurry images. So um, trying to figure out how to, to remain as stable as possible is, is very difficult. And that brings me right to our favorite thing, the exposure triangle, right? So when you're sitting there out there, especially moving around in a boat with a little bit of wind or just the waves or repositioning, even if you lean in your kayak or canoe, you can kind of adjust and move the boat a little bit and it creates a little micro waves. But uh, how do you get a fast shutter speed, right? So what 
what are, if you have a fast shutter speed that allows you to keep those, you know, tack sharp images, what is being sacrificed? Well, maybe you have to have a shallower depth of field. Well, is that the right need for the image you're trying to create? Well, maybe, maybe not. Um, maybe you're going to crank up your ISO and now you start talking about um, noise being introduced to it. So there's all these things that you're trying to figure out like we normally do on a regular scene, but you're also dealing with movement at the same time. So this ends up kind of feeling when you're in a kayak photograph and you feel like more like a sports photographer or a wedding photographer where things are changing very quickly. And how do I balance my shutter speed, my aperture and my ISO at the same time to get it, to get there a great shot. And so I really tend to lean on, on the shutter. I try to as much as I possibly can because otherwise I'm leaving without sharp images. I'd rather a sharp image that has a little bit more no noise to it than a blurry image um, that has no noise because I can't do anything with a blurry image. And then of course, aperture ends up being like, what is your artistic vision for that image? And so it's a constant battle and a constant struggle and it makes it very intimidating to be on the water having to think about these things in that kind of way. Um, some people will change it down where they're more aperture priority or shutter priority or whatever like that. I shoot full manual. So it's trying to be, uh, it's, it's very much a juggling act when you're paddling. And when I talk about kind of taming the chaos, this is an exact idea of what I mean. Uh, so this image is uh, a sunrise. There's a lot of stuff going on here. Uh, on the left side, you've got some really strong dark silhouettes. You've got these kind of spotty um, light areas where the mist has been just kind of hitting or moving through and the, the sunlight is just popping them like spots. You've got moss dripping down. You've got branches horizontal. Um, you've got lots of texture in your reflection. You've got a light beam, all this stuff. Like how do you create an image when there's all this stuff going on? So maybe you use a telephoto lens to zoom in or, or maybe you try to take in a little bit more context. Well, for me, I just said, hey, I'm gonna focus on that light beam and that's kind of, kind of balance the scene a little bit, but there's a lot going on in an image like this. And it can be very distracting for somebody to try to figure out where am I pulling compositions um, out of this type of environment. So as I was kind of talking about wide angle versus telephoto, um, I exclusively use basically the equivalent because I was shooting on an APS-C for a long time. Uh, the equivalent of a 24 to 105 millimeter uh, for 13 years. And that's, you know, just a little bit of reach on that, but mostly it's a wide angle lens. Um, if you're using a wide angle, I mean, you really, frankly, when I go out and bring photographers on, on, on a tour and they're saying, like, you know, what kind of lens do I need to bring? I said, well, one, are you looking for birds and wildlife? If you are, then just bring your telephoto. But if you are wanting a combination and you're looking for some landscape scenes and maybe happen to get some wildlife, bring them both. You just can't go wrong if you've got a wide angle and a telephoto. You just gotta, gotta be prepared for what you have. And when you're on the water, you can't just go grabbing, you know, back to your tr truck or your car and say, hey, let me grab my other thing um, out of it. No, you're on the water, you may be a couple miles from the land, bring it with you. It's better to have it than to not. And so for your wide angle images, you know, you're looking for these big skies like this that you see here above the, the trees. It really helps you to enlarge and exaggerate the, how the trees look as well, so that can kind of make some nice, um, you know, a little bit artificial image to it, but having those trees kind of bending in to, to a focus. Um, and then even though it's probably, you know, poorly thought of, I love the 50-50 reflections. I love putting my horizon, uh, horizon line right in the middle of the image and seeing the tree on the top and the perfect reflection on the base. And so um, wide angle allows you that opportunity. Here's an, a perfect example of kind of doing a, a 50 50 reflection, right? If I had a telephoto, I might be able to focus in on a couple of those trees, but having that larger context really just creates this, this very cool image of everything, kind of trippy a little bit, where you've got the light and the, the reflection and the branches and everything kind of going both directions. Um, I, I tend to like it. I think it just has a, has a different kind of feel than the typical rule of thirds kind of, kind of situation. This may be a little bit closer to a rule of thirds type of deal. Um, but I, I like what the wide angle allows you to do with, with the, getting that kind of 50 50 scene. And then the telephoto, obviously, you know, great for compressing the background. And so you really start to create this dense swamp environment with your telephotos. Um, you can get some great depth of field too if you really want to focus. And again, like I said, trying to find where is it in this chaotic scene, I can focus on this one tree and really blur out the background. And so it kind of stands out on its own. Um, Great for wildlife, as I mentioned. This image though right here was shot with a 70 to 200, probably zoomed all the way in at 200. And 
I could see the composition from my boat, but I knew if I got too close to it, I would ruin that composition. It would change as I got closer to it. And if I had a wide angle, that'd be the only thing, only way I could get, get that same image, but it would be distorted in a way I didn't like. And so using a, a, a telephoto allows me to kind of zoom in a little bit and create these compositions that otherwise would be lost with kind of a wide angle. So I loved how just the, this big moss chunks kind of hanging off of this tree looked and I wouldn't have gotten it otherwise if I had the, the 24 to 105. Again, with a telephoto, that's, I don't have quite the reach. I've only got up to 200 millimeters. So there's a little alligator right here in the middle of the, of the, of the image um, that just happened to be there. But this was a, the shot I was going for when this other sunset was happening. And I just love the way the light was uh, kind of being cast through this really dense area of the swamp. Um, telephoto allowed me to kind of, you know, just get some great kind of blurred out branches here on the right side, a little bit here on the left corner. Um, frankly, kind of looking at it, I may have crop, may crop that out, you know, in, in the future, but really allows me to compress that background. So I've, I've got some really cool um, trees and it really just kind of feels um, almost impenetrable on how the environment is shaped up. Um, regarding filter use, uh, that's another thing that I think is very important. Uh, some people don't use filters, they just do all post-processing with it. You can't really post-process with a polarizer that doesn't really exist. Um, you can with the gradual neutral density filters. Um, I use them both and um, just depending on the scene and kind of how the lighting is and what I wanna balance when it comes to exposure. I'll throw on that, that gradual neutral density filter as well, but always have my polarizer on there because in case I need to cut off reflections or try to make some of the blues, the greens a little bit more vibrant, um, I have that on there. And this is one of those shots where I use both of them. Um, this is the oldest image that I'm sharing tonight. This was taken back in 2010 with the old Canon Rebel. Um, and I've got a, uh, you can barely see it, but I had a really nice light uh, gradual neutral density filter kind of on the top end of the scene to be able to balance out that exposure, probably goes a little bit more of an angle, to be honest, um, and then had that polarizer to really start to get some more vibrancy in that sunrise. Um, this lasted for literally three or four seconds. I got the image, felt very proud of myself for being there um, and, and excited about how it turned out. And then it was gone and it was just a gray morning, but almost this flash of light that came. And if I would have had those filters on there, it would have been a much flatter looking scene. So uh, instead of having to do all this post-processing to try to figure out what, what I saw and, and try to recreate it, um, having those on there helps to kind of make my workflow just a little bit faster when I'm back at home. And then when you're kind of talking about things to look out for, you know, um, when I take somebody out there and we're, we're, we're paddling around, things that you just want to try to avoid in some of your compositions. So the bundled or stacked trees, um, I kind of started to see in my images a while back, like I wasn't paying enough attention to separation. And so I'd have trees that were um, almost look like they were growing out of each other. And because of that, it just kind of seemed odd. They were making some weird shapes. Um, there's a duck blind in one of the locations that we paddle that is right up along a tree. And in a silhouette, it kind of makes an odd shape because you have this beautiful tree and then you have a square edge of a duck blind there, kind of the little area where they're, they're shooting from. Uh, and it's, I don't like the silhouette. And so that bundled or stacked trees, if they're kind of on top of each other without any kind of air or space between them can look a little odd. In some cases, if they're just barely stacked on top of each other, it makes the tree kind of look just how it's growing in a weird way. So I try to avoid that stuff. Uh, any branches kind of coming into my scene that aren't long enough or large enough to have a context to them, I try to avoid as well. You don't want any of these kind of tiny branches just sticking in. Uh, people wonder where are they connected to? And so from a composition, I want to make sure I see a lot of that branch or I want to get rid of it altogether. Um, you know, no separation, as I was kind of saying with those trees, no separation between elements as well. So on a silhouette, if I've got uh, one tree, uh, tied into another one, just the branches connecting. I'm not getting enough space between them and it kind of looks like a jumbled mess a little bit too. And when you've already got a lot of jumbled mess in how the environment grows, you want to try to figure out how do you um, provide the, the viewer some relief there. So having space between it and allowing those branches to, to talk to each other, maybe interact instead of being uh, smashed up together is, is important. 
um, as I mentioned, kind of with the, the duck blind, odd shaped silhouettes. Um, if I have a sign that happens to be on there for like a no hunting sign, I try to avoid trees that may have those on them because I'll see this weird rectangular shape maybe or a weird angle coming out. Uh, I'm sure we can get rid of all that stuff with the clone stamp or a healing brush, but um, you know, try to keep it as real as I possibly can. Uh, crooked horizons, very difficult to, to manage those when you're in the boat and you're moving around. That's why the tripod in the mud uh, becomes your, your best friend. Um, you know, you, you're out there and you're shooting, you're excited and you come back and you've got these, these horizons that are off just one or two degrees. And then when you crop it and turn it and rotate it, you end up losing a lot of context. And you may end up having a situation where because your horizon was crooked, now you have branches that don't have context so you got to crop some of that off. Um, so just kind of things that to look out for. And of course, we are definitely connected to a lot of um, communities still with the swamps. And so there can be litter, there can be property signs, there can be uh, jug lines, little fishing equipment out there in the water. Uh, there can even be uh, invasive vegetation that I don't like to highlight. I try to get rid of any of that stuff um, in my images. If I see a patch of water hyacinth floating by, I patiently wait for it to float by before I get an image. I don't want to put that in, in some of my, my photos. So just making sure you're looking out for these things because you get back to, to your house, you blow them up on the big monitor and you go, crud, I got all this stuff in there that I really wouldn't want to, to show. And a bright orange sign that you happen to miss now is not only seen on the tree, but it's now it's reflected in the water. And it could be, depending on how the water's moving and the light was, it could be a very long orange reflection there. So things just to avoid. And then uh, what I suggest kind of for, for first timers. So if I take somebody out, um, I try to get them to have some sense of focus when they're on the water. So these would be some of the things that we're gonna be talking about uh, when we're paddling out to a location. Here's some compositional ideas for you while you're there. Again, talk, you got a wide angle. Let's see the 50-50 splits on, the, on those compositions. Let's see the, the full tree and the base or, or zoom on in and try to get a 50-50 there. It's, it may not be as well uh, liked from the, you know, the art realm of things, but I like it. So that's what I'm out shooting for. I, like, I wanna shoot images that I like. Um, trying to find a focal point. You know, again, we don't have a big mountain that we can focus on or a waterfall. We've got all these trees that kind of look a little bit similar. They're all covered in moss. They've got weird angles. Find that focus point and that'll help you, uh, you know, create an image that, that you're gonna really appreciate. Maybe explore the macro environments. Uh, it's not always the big skies and things like that. It can be, uh, but maybe look at the, these trees. The trees will have um, ferns growing on them because the leaves have fallen down and gotten caught in the nooks and crannies of the, of the base of the trees, created soil, and then other little plants are starting growing now. So these cool little different environments there or the flowers and things like that are, are kind of nice to do as well. Um, I'd say heavy reflections. Well, maybe you cut out a lot of the, the tree and you really just focus on the, the, the reflection. And in some cases that can look very much like a painting or uh, like an impressionist type of painting there. So there's all kinds of good stuff. Like I said, the big skies, um, looking up underneath the trees and seeing the moss kind of falling down on you like rain is good. Um, you know, if depending on how the, the, the morning is, if you have a little bit of humidity, you might be able to use some light beams or some silhouettes and things like that. So just trying to get them to have a focus when they're out there and they're gonna be, they're gonna have a nice well-rounded portfolio when they leave. And of course, hopefully they've got a sore neck when it's all said and done because they're capturing images from all different directions. So some of the things that, I, that I've, I've shot and kind of just looking for out there that can really add to the scene. I mean, this would have been a beautiful uh, evening in the swamp already, but as I was paddling by, I caught this little spot of light pop right through the base of this tree. And it was the sun was setting and it just happened to reflect off the water. And I was like, man, I got to stop and, and, and reverse my, my kayak. And it took me probably 10, 15 minutes to get this shot the way I really wanted it. All these little adjustments. And of course, having to wait to settle down and get that water nice and calm. But looking for, you know, the opportunity, little starbursts there just to add a little bit of extra punch to some of these images where, it's a beautiful cypress trees, but man, the viewer really likes seeing that extra little element of, of the sun right there. Uh, when you talk about some of these 50-50s, again, um, love the, the kind of the layering you get here. Um, I couldn't get this, this image wouldn't be as, as in my opinion, as, as aesthetically pleasing if it was zoomed in and cropped. If I had just the Top of this tree, maybe here, the taller one cropped uh, at the canopy line there. I think it would just seem a little odd. And so for me, I like to show the whole thing. If I'm not, if I'm gonna show it, I wanna show the whole thing. If I'm, if I'm not, I need to really crop in a lot tighter than that. 
So this, the 50-50s is a great, great way to kind of show the full context of the swamp. And the reflections are really, a lot of times, um, just as big as part of the show as the, the trees and maybe the sky themselves. We'll talk about kind of being a little bit more reflection heavier, reflection centric here. Uh, I, I named this one Cypress Impressionist because the way the reflection is here almost looks like paint, you know, the brush strokes right there on it. And I intentionally decided to put my tree line, the base of the trees higher up in the frame. So that way the foreground, I guess you could say, or the, the main focus would really end up being the, the cool um, painterly look of the reflection. Same kind of idea, you know, I had a beautiful swamp here in the, in the, in the back on, on Fallen Cypress, but really want to use the leading lines to pull people into it. And this is one of those great images to me that really starts to tell the story of, of the deforestation of our swamps here in Louisiana. You can see uh, on this tree at the, at the end right here where the actual stump was still in the water, almost a straight line where it had been cut. And this tree was, was fallen right there um, and was unused. It was a wasted tree that someone had cut, you know, 100 plus years ago. But you can still find it opportunities to pull someone into the scene using some leading lines. And these are things that a lot of photographers already use as kind of the you know, simple tips and tricks to, to get people interested in, in the images that they're creating, but a, tell a story at the same time with it is, just makes it even that much better. Um, isolated trees, uh, great way to, to really bring some attention to something, talk about finding a focus, bam, make a, make, isolate a cypress tree. This is an image that took me 10 years to capture. Um, this tree was a lot tinier when I first started trying to go out there and get this image, but it was one of those things where I just kept going, 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 hoping that conditions would be ideal. And it happened to work out right. I wanted to make sure I had enough uh, fog or mist in the, in the background where this tree would really start to be isolated from the background. If I had uh, too little, then you'd see a lot of these trees off to the left and right of it and it kind of gets lost. If I had too much fog, well, then the tree itself becomes a little bit um, flat looking too. So it ended up being great. I'm super excited that I was able to get this shot. I think I can still try to improve upon it. Maybe a little bit better sunlight coming in there and hitting on the right side of it would have, would have improved it. But it's constantly going out there and, and trying new things and, and looking at all of your apps and, and being there. You got to be there to get these shots. Like I said, 10 years basically of going back and forth, paddling by this tree going, nope, it's not today. Go find something else. Um, but the isolation really creates the, kind of the powerful piece of this image. Um, this one's a Louisiana Christmas tree. So, you know, I'll be honest, uh, kind of a side topic, naming your photos is a big thing too. Um, I hate naming my photos. It's one of my least favorite things I do uh, because it's like, it's like naming your kid. As soon as you name it, you know, well, maybe not with your kids, but maybe uh, you go, well, that would have been a good name. You know, they're five years old. And you're like, oh, I never knew about that name, but some of these photos I name it. I'm like, gosh, I bet you I could, come up with a better name than that. But sometimes the names are really great and they start to really engage the viewer in what you're doing. So I call this one a Christmas tree. What do people want? They want this image now printed and hung on their wall during the Christmas season because it's a Louisiana theme and it's a Christmas theme. So there's little things like that that can help you sell your work too. Um, you have a, a boring flat name and I've got lots of those kind of boring names. Um, Actually, I think they don't sell as well without a cool name on them too. So sometimes I try to add some French names into it uh, just to make it feel more of the place, but having something like Christmas on there, that's going to sell it immediately. But I think the image itself speaks a lot for, for why it's been so popular as well. Uh, talk about the Spanish moss kind of looking up, kind of the backlit areas. You got some great texture, great lighting here too. You know, I threw another little starburst into this one. You know, let me get it that sun just below that branch to add a little extra interest to this image. But if you're looking around, you know, you turn the other direction and you've got a very flat image because the sun is hitting on the Spanish moss and everything's kind of the same, same lighting pattern. You turn around, look towards the sun where you think, hey, I'm not going to be able to really pull anything out of the shadows. Oh no, there's plenty of opportunities, especially with today's cameras. You get some great colors there, great texture. And you can see that, that moss being illuminated and it's super beautiful when you're out there in the environment. Um, talking about some macros too, uh, some of the smaller environments you know, why I love the springtime out there in the swamp. The, the Louisiana irises in bloom are just a, such a beautiful contrast in colors from the greens that have these purples, uh, some of the yellow flag iris blooming as well. And I really wanted just to kind of pinpoint on, on one, one flower here and, and start to, to show the story of, of the springtime out in the swamp. And um, 
beautiful colors, like I said, being able to use uh, shallow depth of field too. So you get some of the purples out of focus really helps uh, kind of draw the, the viewer into to that flower. And then though, I'm not sure if I really like this, the composition of this image as much. And this is another older image, it's probably from 2011 or 12, adding some human elements too. Uh, the scale of the swamp is very hard to understand. Uh, I know as a waterfall photographer, when I lived in North Carolina, it was hard to be able to show what a 60 foot waterfall looked like unless you put someone right next to it and they go, oh, that's a really big waterfall. Otherwise, maybe it's a 10 foot waterfall. Um, you don't really know what you see or what you're looking at until you add something people are a little bit more comfortable with, right? You, so you could put a houseboat in there or, or a camp or uh, someone boating or fishing. Um, all of a sudden you start to create some a human connection to your images. Um, they have an idea of what the scale of that place is. And I think that's uh, something that really ties them and brings them into the image a little bit more. Personally, I wish I had turned my, my lens a little bit more to the right, but I obviously didn't because maybe the scene to the right of the houseboat uh, wasn't exactly what I was looking for. Maybe it was too, too open with the lake and I really wanted to see more of the swamp. But that line there of the, the houseboat really lends my eye to the right side and kind of falls off the image. But um, still just being able to have that houseboat there uh, was a nice touch, I thought, to what that scene was. And then as you get you get the perfect opportunities with, uh, with the, the light and the mist and the humidity out there, you get these awesome light beams that come through. Um, it just basically you got to look at the look at where the sun is and kind of turn a little bit, you know, 15 degrees right or left of that sun, and you'll really see some great uh, light uh, there with the, the mist really full of, of that, those sunbeams. And this creates some awesome layering too. So you get some layers off on the right side of the image of the cypress trees. Um, here's one of those situations where I've got a little bit of a bundled tree here in the middle. I tried to make sure I could find enough air between them there. They just weren't going to be that way. So if I go on a little bit more to the left, they would have been really stacked on top of each other. Um, sometimes you just, you got to deal with how mother nature decides she wants to, you know, to be and, and work around it. But the, the illumination there of the, the mist is, is something that's just super spooky and, and very much uh, what a swamp environment should be. Of course, other things like looking for framing, real easy, right? Finding branches or trees to kind of bookend your images here. Um, I wanted the focus to really be more on the distant trees and, and use the foreground trees to, to frame in this kind of spookier scene. This would have been a winter shot. Obviously, you don't see much color on any of the trees. And that's that dense fog I was talking about that you can find in the wintertime. Really creepy, really haunting. Um, you know, an alligator swimming by at the base of it would have just made it, made it perfect. Uh, but framing this, this stuff up, whether they're, you know, bigger scenes where you've seen a full tree or maybe they're focused on a smaller element like a cypress knee or, or a little uh, songbird on a branch. You know, you could frame that as well. And then, you know, getting up close. So with the wide angle, like I said, kind of exaggerate some of these trees. Um, but I like kind of putting a, a big cypress tree on one side of my, on one side of my frame. And it really starts to show you how big some of these trees are. It exaggerates it a little bit. And so I get to see the, the texture and the buttressing there of that cypress tree. Um, really beautiful, the contrast of the, the bark with those kind of the valleys and everything to the tree. And then use the, the background as just kind of a compliment to it. So all the colors kind of complement that with the reflection. Uh, got a little bit of a, a wake or some waves there at the base too that just added that another little element of texture that brings in a different color and some lines to it to kind of help out and kind of feed off of, of that tree and, and really show that we're, we're, we're moving and being on the water but uh, when you have that tree on that one side nice and big right there you can take up the half the, half the image almost if you want to just provide some additional context on the other side of it with the the surrounding swamps i think makes a, a great shot as well and then, you know, if you get a chance to be on, on dry land, long exposures, you can do some of these uh, in the water too. Um, of course, the depth of the water has to be right. But, you know, this was probably a three minute exposure. I was on dry land. This is on the peninsula there at Lake Martin. And I was able to get some of those clouds moving by. Water was super calm that evening, except for way out here in the distance. You can see a little bit of a, oh, maybe some wind moving on that horizon there that allowed for this little you know, thin, golden line there, but allowed for some long, you know, long exposures and create some additional interest in your skies. 
could make some additional interest in your reflections there and that kind of um, soften everything up, uh, kind of make it you know more glassy than maybe it actually was. But just trying some different things. I mean, you can, the elements you, you can shoot and ideas you can shoot at other places in the country, you can do in the swamp as well. You just gotta kind of pay attention to what you're doing and be a little bit more careful with the, with the water right there. And I believe this is, might be the, the last one here. Um, just talking again about silhouettes too. I love good silhouettes. Um, what I like about this image is really starting to talk about, like I said, trying to keep things apart from each other. So the focus obviously is, a, is the one tree out here in the distance. I did not want to make sure, I want to make sure I didn't have any of these other branches of the other trees touching into where that tree is. I want to make sure I had a good space between it so that way it would stay the focus. As soon as another branch gets too close to it or starts to overlap, it's lost and it becomes kind of a muddier image. Um, so everything else can be kind of crossing and, and, and covered, but the main focus point, I want to make sure there was enough space there to allow you to be able to, your eye to go towards that tree. Um, so that's kind of a, kind of a, a good way of thinking about it. I'm glad I remember to put this one in there when you talk about things overlapping, but that tree right there standing out from itself would just look way worse if it wasn't, uh, if it was kind of jammed in with some other branches. And then um, just some last little couple images here, just always trying to challenge myself. Uh, over the last year and a half, I really got into panoramas. It's been um, an incredible passion for me. I don't know why I've become so addicted to panoramas, but I think it's just trying to see the bigger images that, that I can either print for myself and have more context to the scenes. Um, so just a few images here of, of some of the panoramas that I've had a chance to, to work on. This one's up at, at Caddo Lake. Um, even though you have this big pano, you still gotta find focus in these, in these images. And for me, that focus was the, the, the kind of the leaning tree, right? You know, that was a great odd thing to have this angular line moving through the scene so I can have this really nice reflection, great soft colors everywhere, but contrast it with this beautiful angled um, tree right there. And so just makes for, uh, I think, a lot more interest in the scene. If I didn't have that tree and you just erased it, for instance, it would just, it would kind of feel, you know, it feels like a, a forest, but that tree really starts to pull you into to the image a little bit more. Uh, same thing here. Um, this is a shot called Forgotten in Bayou uh, Grobeck. And without this sunken houseboat, it'd just be, you know, sunset kind of time frame there in the swamp. I like the, the inclusion of the house because, again, it provides some scale there for you. Uh, the fact that it's sinking provides a little bit of drama too for people like, oh, that seems uneasy, kind of creepy. And then I really like the, I, I couldn't manage the sky well here. It was a very blue sky. And I ended up just kind of going with an ex overexposed sky to really start to just make these, this kind of weird line of the, the trees. I thought if I kept the blue there, it may have kind of blended in. So having overexposed it a little bit, when you, when you see it, especially on a white background, uh, makes it have this really neat line there kind of around the canopy. Uh, second to last one, I believe right here. This is uh, Cypress Lake over at the University of Louisiana at Lafayette. They have live alligators on campus. If you've never been over to, the, to the, where the raging Cajuns are um, here in Lafayette, uh, just trying to sit there and see this full swamp scene on, on a campus. Um, the alligators obviously are the show right here. These alligators decided to fight right after I took the shot and covered me with mud and my camera with mud. Um, I was happy to be in dress clothes at the time because I just showed up randomly to hopefully get some images of the, of the, the little lake there covered in mud. But uh, I wanted, I really like the, the branch here on the left side, although it seems kind of random here uh, because it just makes me feel like I'm really engaged in, in, in inside this environment right here. Uh, I'm pretty darn close to these alligators actually. So it was probably shot at like 35 millimeters, but uh, I liked the, the idea of, of being fully kind of engaged and, and surrounded by the swamp that the panorama provides. And then this last one was just taken this past weekend um, out there in the Atchafalaya near Henderson. And I wanted to, to create my biggest panorama yet. So this is a, a 13 image stitch of a sunrise out there in the Atchafalaya. So you see the sunrise or the light of the sunrise coming up on the right side all the way, probably, gosh, about 90 degrees or so, I think in this image um, that allows you to get all the way turned away from the sun there too. So you just get a little bit of sun um, on the sides of the trees. So just has been a, a passion of mine recently, just to try to bring in some new images and, and continue to be creative out there and show things in a different way and, and hopefully inspire people to, you know, to go out there and shoot themselves and, and want to see this environment firsthand. But um, 
it's been an incredible honor to be uh, able to photograph and, and grow up in this area. I, I, I feel like I get to be a bit of an ambassador through my images and hopefully have a, a great impact on the future of this area. And so with that, I really appreciate the time and the opportunity to speak with you. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. Um, I have some questions. So I'm gonna get you to uh, take that screen down. I'll let you grab a drink of water if you want. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you gave us so much great information. Okay, guys, last call for questions. So if you have any and you want them answered, stick them in the chat. Um, Mika's wanting to know, do you use two camera bodies, each with a different lens when you're on the water? I wish I, I wish I had that kind of money to have a second camera body. No, I'm, I'm changing them out. Um, and when I got the Canon R, and I'm not sure how the other bodies are, it has, when you turn it off, it closes on the, the shutter has a protective piece, which really was a big selling point for me. So I can change out those lenses without much concern. The problem with it though is changing out lenses and when it's super humid, right? You can get some condensation on your glass, both on the internal and the external. And so I uh, gotta be real careful. I definitely have my lenses out uh, warming up, you know, prior to, to moving anything around and changing stuff out. But it's one camera body and I just unfortunately have to change it out. Okay. Um, ben wanted to know, uh, there was a lot of chat about canoes and kayaks, um, but Ben wanted to know, is there a reason that you shoot from a kayak rather than a canoe? Um, just mobility, I guess. Uh, the, the kayak is, is a 12 foot kayak that I shoot from. So it's a little bit lighter. It's easier for me to put on the back of my truck in my truck bed. If I have a canoe, um, I'm typically in a tandem canoe and that's 17 feet long. So it's a little bit more arduous to move around. It's heavier, things like that. Now, if I'm taking a photographer out there, uh, a couple of options, usually I can, they can either be in a, their own separate kayak or what I really like to do is put the photographer in the bow of the boat up in the front and I'll do all of the paddling while they're focusing on the photography. So that way they can worry about their settings and making sure they're getting the right shots. And I can just do all those little adjustment paddles to get them right where they need to be. So I can help identify some, some compositions and they can, they can focus on, on what they came for, which is taking beautiful photos. Yeah, I, I like the part where you had told me the other day that it's worth repeating. He's willing to paddle while <laughs> I would be in the front or any other photographer because I don't paddle. That's a whole nother story. Um, I, I, um, yeah, I, I like to be a princess. Okay, so Jill wants to know if you can uh, remember what time of year was the image uh, that was called Into the Swamp taken? Do you recall? I think that's one of the yep. elephants. With the alligator in it, maybe the yeah, yeah, yeah. Into the swamp was taken three weeks ago. Okay. Oh wow. Okay, that's <laughs> yep, a lot yep. of fear. <laughs> yep. Um, that was uh, that August, just kind of uh, yeah, I'd say three weeks ago. I think it's when we were out there. Yep. <laughs> it was it was a little bit it was a little mosquitoy towards the end. So when the sun is going down and the sun was over, the sun was up. Uh, when this, that sunset happened, no problems. Um, when I tried to really push it and get a couple additional shots uh 10 minutes or so after sunset we could hear hear the buzzing coming uh from the woods so we had we, you know beelined it back to to dry land as quickly as we possibly could but uh while we were out there on the water there was no mosquitoes up until after a little after the sun had gone down okay um martha was a little late coming into the room but um you talked about the gators earlier but she's yep. wondering have you ever had any issues with them personally no 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 issues at all um okay. i, I the issue, well, I, I should say, the issues I have with them is that they don't stay close enough for me to be able to photograph with my 200 millimeter. If I had a 400 reach or a 600, um, I could get a lot, you know, better shots of, of some of the alligators, but they're not very cooperative. They, they like to go about their own business. Okay. Um, and Jamie has the same question I had because I'm navigationally challenged. Jamie's question is, have you ever gotten hopelessly lost? <laughs> Admit it. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I, I've never gotten lost because uh, um, I'm, I'm, I'm a map nerd, but I have gotten stranded. Ooh. So that was a, that was actually more terrifying than in my my opinion, uh, because I had everything I needed. I was in a boat and went out there to do some scouting. It was in the middle of the day. Um, 
it happened to be Super Bowl Sunday, which was a bad choice of mine because <laughs> no one else was on the water that day. It all left early to go home so they could start grilling and getting prepared for watching the big game. And I was out there on the water by myself, stuck with a motor that wasn't working. So uh, it was a, that's why I like being in a kayak because I'm up to my, you know, the only engine I have to worry about are my arms as opposed to, you know, something else. So. Okay. Um, Tobias, who was out on Caddo Lake this morning, I believe is what I saw, Tobias, um, he's wanting to know, how far are you needing to kayak from the launch to get out to the more open stretch at the Ashafalaya? Okay, um, not very far. Um, so okay. it, it really depends on where you're going though. Uh, so some of those uh, shots at, at Lake Foss Point, you know, you can, you can go a half mile, you can be a, actually you could be a quarter mile from the land and find some great images. Uh, the further away you get from land though, that's where you're gonna find images that other people haven't taken because as we as photographers tend to move pretty slow when we got the camera in hand. So we end up staying within a certain range. As soon as you get beyond that and you say, hey, look, I'm just gonna paddle and paddle and paddle. That's when you can find some, some original shots of trees that people don't typically get photos of. Uh, and I'm, uh, unfortunately, sometimes I'm, I'm stuck getting those same trees too because I just find great light and I don't wanna waste it paddling. So, uh, but not very far, Tobias, it could be you know, a quarter mile, half mile, even a mile paddle, that was only going to take you about 10 minutes to 15 minutes. So it's not really that much of a time issue okay. for you. Okay. Um, I'm, I think as, I think I covered all the questions and if I missed one, I apologize. But um, Susan Hansen put in here a comment and I wanted to read it to you. Um, she says, I think your whole presentation speaks to the importance of really knowing a place and to know it, you have to be there again and again and again. And I, that's so true, so true. And um, your body of work is a perfect example of the time and energy that you've put into your photography and the love of, of this area um, that you, you've just photographed beautifully. I think everybody's going to have their own favorite image that you showed but mine was it just I saw it um the other day and then again tonight I was like yep still my favorite uh was was the portal oh, oh my goodness. yeah that is it's breathtaking and if I don't get that shot when I come to visit I'm really gonna be pissed <laughs> but I, I mean I know you've got you've got to hit that you've got to hit it just right and that is such a beautiful image um Ben I, um, I know that you do photography um, tours and you, you do some guiding. So if you'd like to share with us, you know, how people can, um, I'll, I'll give them your Instagram and your website, but um, what kind of trips do you do? Or do you, you mind telling us just a little bit about that? Yeah, um, yeah, real quick. Uh, I do sunrise, sunset stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so it's usually about a three hour time frame on the water. I want to get on the water at least a half an hour before sunrise, maybe a little bit earlier, depending on the conditions. And we'll be on the water until kind of the lighting is, is not is what we consider ideal. So, uh, you know, if that's a 630 sunrise, we're trying to get on the water for about six and get our, you know, our water legs under us and, and make sure we're understanding the environment. And then we'll be off the water by nine o'clock or so and, and have the rest of the day. Um, I've been doing it for a long time. I've guided people from Time Magazine, obviously with the Boy Scouts America and, and, and Scouting Magazine and Boys Life, uh, to, uh, had them out there. But I've had photographers from all corners of the, of the world. In fact, I get a chance to, to do that even more so this uh, this fall, I've got a chance to, to partner with another photographer um, out of country, and I'm going to be helping lead a 10 day workshop with them. So uh, just a little side thing that I like to do, you know, so taking off from my, my nonprofit work to be able to go out there and try to introduce a different type of clientele to the environment. Yeah, that's awesome. Ben, uh, I just met you the other day and, you know, like for real, like over Zoom, because that's now we're real friends. But <laughs> <laughs> I... I truly, truly appreciate the time that you took to put this presentation together and to come in and talk to my group of photography friends that, you know, I personally was excited. Um, I will probably be out your way sooner than, <laughs> than I had even planned because you really have inspired me to, to get out there and, and I'm just kind of excited about it. Um, autumn is around the corner and I, I, 
my experience in Caddo Lake in autumn was absolutely uh-huh. just your eyes just pop out of your head it's just absolutely beautiful and so i have not ventured over to louisiana but um that i think that's going to happen pretty soon um any final thoughts last words before i close you out no i just again just really appreciate it uh the opportunity uh, oh, yeah. hope, hopefully like like you just said linda hopefully this has inspired people to to get out into this environment and and see it as a uh, you know, photographic subject in that it's really is beautiful. And the images that you take when you come down here um, to Louisiana or any swamps, yeah. when you photograph swamps or wetlands can really have a larger impact on those environments than you even know. Um, so do your best to capture those beautiful images for us and, and share them with as many people as possible. Because if we don't have the people seeing these and, and understanding a little bit more about these environments, we're going to lose them. Uh, so I really just thank everybody for, for their future photos that they're going to be taking out there. So well, thank you, Ben. You guys can connect Ben through his website, benpiercephotography.com. And if you're on Instagram and you are not following him, go look him up at Ben Pierce Photography. Next week, Colorado-based nature and landscape photographer, Martha Montiel, will be here to talk about freelance photography. Until next time, go out and create something beautiful. And I hope that we see you again soon.